Our next speaker, Beth Shapiro, is an evolutionary biologist who investigates the population history of recently extinct or threatened species. As a pioneer in the field of ancient DNA, Shapiro uses genetic material covered from the remnants of plants and animals that lived long ago to study evolution and explore how species and ecosystems have changed over time. She was the first to apply DNA in population genetics, and she even holds the record for the oldest DNA analyzed from a 700,000-year-old horse. Her research paves the way for methods of genetic rescue to be used in scientific pursuits of saving current animals from future extinction. Shapiro is currently the, the Associate Director of the Genomics Institute, Co-Director of the Paleogenomics Lab, and Professor in Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Today, she will shed light on the future of extinction. Please welcome Beth Shapiro. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I'm honored to be here in front of this huge audience. Um, it's very exciting. Uh, the topic that I was given is uh, the future of extinction, but probably more realistically, I should be speaking about a future with fewer extinctions or even possibly a future where we are reversing extinctions. I'm actually asked to talk about de-extinction a lot, which is fair enough because I wrote this book a few years ago with uh, Princeton University Press called How to Clone a Mammoth, which I guess gives the impression that if one were to have the right bits and pieces and possibly some expensive equipment, you could follow the instructions in this book and end up with a mammoth. Um, perhaps a bit disingenuous. It does have a, a subtitle, The Science of De-Extinction, which is a more honest appraisal of what's inside. I try to walk through the entire process of bringing an extinct species back to life from finding the right specimens to figuring out how to develop that specimen into an actual living, breathing thing and also releasing it into the environment. But my idea was to go over the challenges and, and hurdles that would be uh, encountered along this path, both technical as well as ethical and ecological hurdles. It turns out, though, that um, people don't usually read subtitles, and this has led to a bit of uh, disillusionment. Um, based on some of the emails and phone messages I've received, I thought I would start by reading one of those to you, actually. Um, Let's see here. I've been sitting on it, sorry. Dear Dr. Shapiro, I am extremely disappointed in the content of your book. I purchased both your book and Authentic Mammoth Hair, because you can do that. <laughs> Only to learn after the second chapter, exclamation point in parentheses, that it is not actually possible to clone a mammoth. My daughter is inconsolable. <laughs> I will be returning and not recommending your book. <laughs> okay, fair enough. It isn't actually possible to clone a mammoth. And that's because, at least right now, the one thing that we really need if we're going to bring a mammoth back to life is an actual mammoth. Whoops. Um, but just because the technology doesn't exist to bring a sphinx species back to life doesn't mean that these same technologies that would be required to do so might not also be applicable to trying to solve some of the problems that we're actually facing in the present day. So I thought I'd start by putting the extinction crisis that we're currently undergoing in some actual context here, just to give you an idea of what's going on. Obviously, extinctions have always happened. They've happened throughout geological history at a rate that's estimated to be proportional to the number of species that are around. So the bottom of this slide here, you see the background rate of extinctions. The reason that people are concerned today, calling today the sixth extinction, is because the rate of extinction is estimated to be somewhere in the order of 22 times higher than that background extinction rate. And these are species that are disappearing mostly because of changes that we are imposing, we as humans are imposing on the environment. 
But the extinction crisis itself is not really the full scale of the problem. And here's a figure from a more recent paper that outlines not species extinctions, but population extinctions. And there's a lot of detail in here, but really the main take-home point is that anything you see in blue, more than 50% of the populations that have existed in that population, of that species have disappeared since the turn of the last century. Now, this is bad news, but it's also good news for the future because it means that if 50% are gone, we still have 50% left to work with, which means we do have the possibility of actually trying to slow this crisis down and save some of these species from extinction. So as I see it, there are three different pathways that we have to preventing and preserving biodiversity. The first is to continue along what we're doing right now, the conservation biology status quo. Really important and good and well thought through and proven things like preserving habitats and thinking about how we might be able to successfully manage the populations that still exist. There's also genetic rescue, the idea that we might be able to use biotechnologies, genome sequencing, for example, to be able to learn which populations are threatened and which populations aren't and come up with some strategies for preserving those that we might think are in danger of becoming extinct. And of course, there's de-extinction, this idea that we might actually bring some extinct species back from the dead. So just to get an idea of where we are here, can I get a show of hands for who believes in each of these three things? Only vote once, but vote quickly, all right? Who wants path A? Let's just keep doing what we're doing because it's great. It's really good and it's working and everything else is scary. Wow, you guys are a crazy, not particularly conservative group. Who wants path B, genetic rescue? Let's do this stuff. Who wants dinosaurs? There's always somebody who wants dinosaurs in the path. All right, for the conservative among us who picked pathway A, this is an actually good plan. We are making incredible bounds doing the things that we're doing right now. There are fantastic habitat, terrestrial, marine reserves. We're developing new methods for sustainable agriculture. There are lots of different approaches to conserving resources. We can go into different places and actually pull out invasive species. And we're using technologies like radio collaring and tagging to figure out what species ranges might look like and how those ranges are changing with the the increasing human footprint. I was actually brought into a, one of these radio collaring programs recently for this cat, the cat of many names, puma, cougar, panther, catamount, mountain lion. There are other names for this cat too, but it's always the same cat. Um, there's a project in my backyard, Santa Cruz Mountain Lions project, where they radio collar these guys and then they can track them every five minutes to see where they're going. They actually cross the road in front of my house and use my backyard quite often to hunt deer, um, so I don't let my kids go outside at dusk, but that's a thing. They brought us in because they were interested to see if we could use genomics to add to these radio collar uh, pathways that they're seeing, um, to see whether or not we can see how often we get long distance dispersal, perhaps from one population to another. And in this project, we've sequenced a whole bunch of different genomes. This is work in my lab, mainly that's led by a uh, graduate student, that is Sremi, and postdoc uh, Megan Supple, with some help from some colleagues at Santa Cruz. And we've collected whole genome sequences from mountain lions, panthers, from five different populations, Santa Cruz and Santa Monica, which is around LA, from Brazil and also from Yellowstone and Florida. And we've reconstructed their evolutionary and demographic history using these data. This is a plot called a PSMC plot that shows changes in effective population size over time. Bigger populations are high numbers, smaller populations are low numbers. And what we see here is that there's a pretty continuous, they're all pretty much the same for each of these. There is a slight separation here between the Brazilian individuals and the North American individuals. This probably represents the time when the North American individuals came out of South America America to colonize North America. So the fossil record suggests that mountain lions went extinct during the ice ages across North America and then reinvaded from South America. This trajectory of reconstructed population history suggests that that is true. And here what we see is a genome tree, a whole genome phylogeny, phylogeny, which also shows this same pattern, where we see that the North American individuals are all closely related to each other. So when mountain lions first went from South America back into North America, there were probably very few barriers to their dispersal. They were able to go pretty much across the entire continent and colonize things. This is very different from the picture that we're seeing today, and that's also reflected in this genomic data. Here we see that the individuals from the same population are very closely related to each other, which is predicted because individuals who live close together are likely to mate with individuals who live near them. So you see this sort of population structure emerging. 
But if we look more closely at the genomes, and this is just one of the chromosomes that we've mapped across, what you see is this alarming pattern where there are long regions where the two chromosomes in the individuals are identical. These long blocks that are colored are all regions where the heterozygosity differences in a sliding window across the genome goes almost to zero. The only way that this can happen is if mom and dad had the same copy of DNA that that, that, that child inherited. And that can only happen if there's inbreeding. So what these long tracks of color are telling us is that there's been very common and constant recent inbreeding in nearly all of these North American populations, and not as much in the South American population in Brazil. The problem with inbreeding is that it can lead to a phenomenon called inbreeding depression. And the panthers, puma, mountain lion, catamount, are actually a famous example of inbreeding depression. Many of us know the story of the Florida panther, the population that became so isolated from all the other mountain lions that were there that they started showing these signs, heart defects, um, these kinked tails that you see right here, and then malformed sperm, sperm, undescended testicles. They couldn't actually interbreed. And so, in the mid-1990s, the question was asked, is it possible to restore the genetic diversity that is lost in this population because they can no longer get input from DNA, fresh DNA, from individuals from outside that population? Remember, the panther population was once connected entirely across the continent after that reinvasion from South America. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife went to Texas, the closest individuals to Florida, therefore probably the most closely related to them, and they moved individuals, females, about eight of them, I believe, from the Texas population into Florida. Five of these individuals contributed offspring, and in fact, because this translocation of individuals injected new genetic material into this population, it actually fixed the problems. The kink tails disappeared, and the individuals were able to start mating again. This actually is a transition from traditional, traditional conservation approaches to genetic rescue, Plan B. And yet, it's not scary. When many of us think about genetic rescue, the first, first idea that we have is that, oh, that's kind of dodgy, scary, dangerous biotechnology stuff. We're going to mess things up. But in fact, genetic rescue is not entirely about crazy scientists moving DNA around from place to place. Sometimes it's just about moving individuals informed by the evolutionary history. But translocation doesn't always work. There's a, a population of wolves that lives in Isle Royale National Park in Lake Superior in Michigan in the U.S. It's a small little island. And in the 1940s, wolves, probably two or three individuals, crossed 15 miles of ice in Lake Superior during the winter and colonized this particular island. And then it didn't freeze very many winters after that, so they didn't get very much input of new DNA. And this population started to suffer the effects of inbreeding depression. Again, heart defects, um, they were quite sick, they got malformations of the spine, etc. In 1997, this is two years after the successful introduction of Texas panthers into Florida, an individual wolf naturally crossed the frozen water, he's called Old Grey Guy, and colonized Isle Royale. And people were excited that this meant that this population was going to be restored, that they could be rescued, much like the Florida panthers had been rescued from this input of DNA. And initially, it worked. In the first few generations, the, the, the spinal malformities disappeared, the wolves were again able to reproduce, but within a decade, old gray guy was the father, grandfather, great-grandfather, brother, uncle of more than 50% of the wolves that were on Isle Royale, and very quickly, the spinal malformations reappeared. So why, why did translocation fail in this particular case? And uh, to, to really dig into that, we can go back to the panther example, because it turns out that the Florida panthers that we know of today, they live in Big Cypress National Preserve, are not the only population of panthers that have lived in Florida that have gone through this problem. In fact, there used to be a population in Everglades National Park that in the 80s were also beginning to exhibit these signs of inbreeding depression. There was a, there's a, there still is as this roadside zoo thing in Bonita Springs, Florida called Everglades, Everglades Wonder Gardens. And in the, the 1960s, um, they went to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the managers, sorry, it was the 80s, the managers of 
the Everglades Park, went to Les Piper and said, can we have some of your panthers to reintroduce into Everglades National Park so that we can sort of beef up this population because they're in trouble and they're on the verge of going extinct. And he gave them a few of the panthers that were released into the wild. Unbeknownst to them, Les Piper had actually beefed up his own population by breeding them with panthers from Costa Rica several generations earlier. This was actually discovered before genomics was possible by Steve O'Brien and Melody Rolke, who were working on monitoring the population in Everglades National Park, and they were kind enough to give us a sample of this now extinct population so that we could get a genome and see if we could dig into this question. And our genomic data showed that, yes, in fact, this was true. Here we see the Everglades population individual. This is a mitochondrial tree. It has a mitochondrial haplotype that falls with these South American panthers that we have. All the North American individuals have a nearly identical mitochondrial haplotype. If we look at the nuclear phylogeny, this is a kind of phylogeny that allows us to ask whether there is evidence of, of of outcrossing or admixture in a population. So here we have the Everglades individual falling close to the other Florida panthers, but the real evolutionary history of that individual requires genetic input from that South American clade. So this is a well-supported uh, tree showing evidence of this, this outcrossing admixture event. And again, if we look at this distribution of heterozygosity across the genome, these black dots there are the proportion of sites that are heterozygous, where mom and dad differ, in a sliding window across the genome. And you can see that the dots are actually higher in Brazil than they are in the North American populations, meaning that overall heterozygosity is higher in the South American populations. In this Everglades individual, we have that same higher amount of heterozygosity in the genomes, but we're also starting to see these long, blocks of homozygosity, where mom and dad had the same allele. This is because once we have the input of DNA, we do get this immediate outcrossing event. But if the population stays small, if the population does not receive the injection of new DNA from somewhere else, we will have additional inbreeding events. One generation of outbreeding is insufficient to genetically rescue a population. Unless we can restore the connectivity between populations that used to connect them to allow individuals to naturally move into that population, we are going to have to become more conscientious gardeners of the rest of this planet. We're going to have to continue to intervene if we want the populations to survive. But what happens if there is only one population left? If you can't actually reach to a related population and add genetic diversity by outcrossing, admixture, outbreeding, translocation. The wolves and the panthers are just one of many different populations that could benefit from this type of technology if another population exists. One example of a species where they really are the very last of their kind is the black-footed ferret. Black-footed ferrets live across the North American plains. They like to eat prairie dogs, and prairie dogs like to dig holes in complex little tunnel histories, which means that uh, they are very annoying to farmers. So over the course of the last century or so, there have been some complicated programs to eradicate prairie dogs, and therefore black-footed ferrets, from across the North American plains until there were pretty much none left. In the 80s, Fish and Wildlife took the remaining black-footed ferrets out of the wild and put them into a captive breeding program to try to see if they could beef up that population. And they could, because black-footed ferrets are very good at making more black-footed ferrets, even in captivity. However, they have a problem, and that is that as soon as they are released into their environment, they get sick and they die. So they're facing two challenges. First, they're one population, they're incredibly inbred, and they're losing genetic diversity. And second, they are challenged constantly by sylvatic plague. Fortunately, there are solutions to these problems. Initially, the solution might be that we can actually look not to another living population, but to an extinct population. And thanks to the efforts of Ollie Ryder over here and the San Diego Frozen Zoo, they have been collecting tissue specimens from alive individuals from endangered species for several, several decades now. And they have this incredible collection called the Frozen Zoo. And there are four black-footed ferrets that are in that collection that were collected prior to their near extinction. They represent population genetic diversity that used to exist. 
we could potentially, we have sequenced the genomes of these individuals and identify where they're different from the black-footed ferrets that are alive today, and we could use genome editing technologies potentially to insert some of that diversity back into the population. A challenge, obviously, is what to do. We know very little about the genomes of non-model organisms, but that is a technical challenge that we can get over. The second idea is that the black-footed ferret actually has a cousin, the domestic ferret, that is naturally resistant to plague. And so there are teams of researchers in the Earlham Institute at uh, the Smithsonian, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and with Revive and Restore in Sausalito, who've been working to do a comparative genomics approach to identifying which parts of the domestic ferret genome are associated with disease resistance. And the researchers of the Earlham Institute have actually identified several candidate regions that are now going into culture-based experiments to see if, if, if challenged with plague, if these really are the regions of the genome that are associated with resistance. One can imagine, then, if you could identify those regions of the genome, you could use these gene editing technologies to actually insert, from one species to another, plague resistance into black-footed ferrets. So I guess genetic rescue is sometimes about scientists moving DNA from one species to another. <laughs> Of course, this is an animal example, and it's also an example of something that hasn't quite happened yet. So how do we know if it's real, if it's actually going to happen? There is a successful example. The American chestnut was once the most common tree, one of the most common trees in the Eastern American forest. It had a very broad natural distribution when Europeans first arrived on the continent. But around the turn of the 20th century, a blight, a fungus blight, was introduced from Japan that started to kill these trees. And now nearly all of them are dead. There are no large trees, but some of the trees still send up little shoots, and until they get to be a, a width of about a few centimeters across, the blight can't actually infect and kill them. So these shoots keep surviving, and some of those shoots actually produce seeds and berries. And there's a team led by Bill Powell from uh, SUNY who have engineered blight resistance into remaining American chestnut trees by taking a gene from uh, wheat that actually uh, allows the plant to be able to sustain life even in the presence of this fungus by, by, by getting rid of the acid that causes the, the reduced pH that kills the plant. And last week or this week, uh, they have announced that they are now petitioning the three different government organizations in the U.S. necessary to be able to release these transgenic trees into the actual habitat. So this is an example of an actual transgenic forest species, probably the first of its kind, and I think really a harbinger of the future. What else could, might this do? Um, we know that coral reefs are in trouble. There's actually research that is aimed at engineering the, the, the symbionts of coral to be able to move heat resistance, heat tolerance, and other environmental-driven challenges, genes to resist these particular things between species of corals. We can also imagine finding cures within the forests for terrible things like the spruce beetle tragedy, or even um, combating populations of small mammals, particularly if they're carriers of diseases that infect humans. This is the future of genetic rescue. But it also is kind of a transition into de-extinction. Because remember, I did say that one of the ideas of what we could do with black-footed ferrets was actually move extinct DNA into living species. This is a kind of de-extinction, and probably the kind of de-extinction that might actually happen someday. But when you guys think about de-extinction, you're obviously thinking about dinosaurs and mammoths. So we may as well talk about that for a minute. I said before that, uh, that the very first thing that one would need in order to bring a mammoth back to life is an actual mammoth, and that still is true. That still is true today, and this is because when you clone something, you have to begin with a living cell. This is, of course, a, a very simplistic diagram of what would happen here. You take a, an egg cell and you suck out the nuclear material, and then you inject in its place an actual living nuclear, nucleus from an actual living animal so that it can jumpstart the process of cellular differentiation and development. The most recent population of mammoths to be alive lived until around 3,000 years ago on Wrangell Island, which is off the northeastern coast of Siberia. We do get incredibly well-preserved remains of mammoths and, and other species from that particular site, but there are no living cells, because once an organism dies, that process of cellular repair, which is energy-requiring, 
ceases to happen. And of course, things like solar radiation and UV radiation will break down the DNA until there's nothing left to be sequenced. We can sequence and assemble genomes from that tiny little crappy bits of degraded DNA, of course, and we have done that. And potentially, we have also then lined up the sequence of the mammoth genome against the sequence of the Asian elephant genome in the computer and figured out where they differ from each other. That's about 1% difference, about the same as between us and chimpanzees. We can identify those 1.5 million or so differences, and then we could potentially use genome editing technology to make those changes, and then, of course, we would would have to figure out how to get that individual into a female elephant, and uh, then it would have to be born and raised by elephants. And it's hard to imagine that all of those things would happen, and we would end up with something more than just potentially a, a slightly, slightly hairier elephant. <laughs> but I think a bigger question might be, what do we do with them then? What happens after we've brought back these populations of extinct species? Because clearly we don't want to bring them back just to put them in a zoo. Where could billions of passenger pigeons go today? Or what about this, uh, the idea of bringing back saber-toothed cats and giant short-faced bears? Where would they go on our anthropogenically changed landscape? And there are also natural changes to landscapes that happen. If we think about mammoths and mastodons and, and woolly rhinos, they lived in this very rich steppe tundra that today, because we are no longer in an ice age, looks more, more like this. Here's a picture of the U.S. from NASA, just to get an idea of the scope of anthropogenic changes to our landscape. If we're going to bring back passenger pigeons, we're going to have to restore this landscape to what it looked like when they dominated. That was, that was more than 500 years ago. Maybe we should, we should aim for 1491. This is a common call. We should restore the landscape to 1491. But we have no mammoths then, so we have to go back further for that. Shall we restore the landscape to 8,000 years ago when mammoths disappeared on the island? Or, or perhaps Perhaps we need to go even further back in time until before humans arrived more than 20,000 years ago. The truth is that ecosystems change. They change constantly through time. And today, there are more than 41,000 species that's still alive today, that still have habitat today, that are on the endangered species list. And I think we should focus our efforts here, not on bringing things back where it's very difficult to imagine how we might give them a place to live. To do that, we do have to think about the types of approaches that we've been using for a long time. But we also need to consider some of these new, potentially scary biotechnological approaches. We should use genomics, we should consider translocation, and even think about genetic rescue and maybe even de-extinction of traits or phenotypes that might be useful today. Of course, these technologies all come with risks, as does any new idea or intervention or technology. But these risks, to me, are worth it, because it's clear that we don't want a future with more headlines like these, but we want a future with fewer extinctions. Thank you. <laughs>